Hello everyone and welcome to the Unanswered Questions True Crime Podcast. I have spent hours and hours investigating this. He basically told her that people have been killed. Journalists, independent investigators, people like that disappeared. It frightened her to the bone. There's more to the story than meets the eye. There were rumors of torture and homicide and sexual abuse, all sorts of egregious, horrendous crimes. He was polygraphed three times. Each of those three showed evasions. His resumes were a skeleton of truth. He was mad at the world, and particularly mad at the government. The study that he commissioned that described a fictional terrorist attack. If people have died over this, it means you're getting close to the truth. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to say, what the fuck? Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy and as always leave me some feedback on what you think about the show and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about Jack the Stripper or more commonly known as the Hammersmith Nude Murders. Now, as I understand it, the Hammersmith Nude Murders is the name of a series of six murders in West London, England, between 1964 and 1965. The victims, all prostitutes, were found undressed in or near the River Thames, leading the press to nickname the killer Jack the Stripper, a reference to Jack the Ripper. Two earlier murders committed in West London in 1959 and 1963, respectively, have also been linked by some investigators to the same perpetrator. Despite intense media interest in one of the biggest manhunts in Scotland Yard's history, the case is unsolved. Forensic evidence gathered at the time is believed to have been destroyed or lost. Now we're going to get into the victims. First we have Elizabeth Figg. Figg was found dead at 5.10am on the 17th of June 1959 by police officers on routine patrol in Dukes Meadows, Chiswick on the north bank of the River Thames. The park had a reputation as a lover's lane and prostitutes were known to take their clients there. Figg's body was found on scrubland between Dan Mason Drive and the river's towpath approximately 200 yards or 180 metres west of Barnes Bridge. Her dress was torn at the waist and open to reveal her breasts. Marks around the neck were consistent with strangulation. Figg's underwear and shoes were missing and no identification or personal possessions were found. A pathologist concluded the death had occurred between midnight and 2am on the 17th of June. A postmortem photograph of Figg's face distributed to the press was independently recognised by her roommate and her mother. Extensive searches of the area, including the riverbed itself, failed to find Figg's underwear, black stiletto shoes or white handbag. A police official later theorised that she had been murdered by a client in his car after removing her shoes and underwear and that these in her handbag had then remained in the car after the body was disposed of at Duke Meadows. The proprietor of a pub on the opposite side of the river to where Fig was found said that on the night of the murder, he and his wife had seen a car's headlights as it parked in that area at 12.05am. Shortly after the lights were switched off, they heard a woman's scream. Fig's boyfriend, Fenton Ward, was an early suspect in the murder. Apparently, he was known to beat Fig on occasion and was also known to act as a pimp. However, Ward was soon ruled out of the murders after police inquiries. Then we have Gwyneth Rees. The body of Welsh-born Gwyneth Rees was found on the 8th of November 1963 at the Barnes Borough Council Household Refusal Disposal Site on Talmud Road, Mortlake. The dump was situated 40 yards or 37 metres from the Thames towpath and approximately 1 mile or 1.6 kilometres from Duke's Meadows. Rees was naked except for a single stocking on her right leg extending no further up than the ankle. She had been accidentally decapitated by a shovel which workmen had been using to level the refuse. Originally from Wales, Reese had gone to London after falling out with her family and with an unwanted pregnancy. Sadly, despite wanting a better life, Reese, like so many young women at the time, fell into prostitution. Interestingly, her pimp was a known associate of infamous criminals of the time, Ronnie and Reggie Cray. Cornelius Connie Whitehead was well known for giving the girls a good thumping and was reported to be looking for Reese just before her disappearance, thus making him a solid suspect in Reese's murder. Another theory for Gwyneth's murder was that it was an illegal abortion gone wrong. Rees had found herself pregnant and was said to have been asking fellow prostitutes for anyone they knew who could perform an abortion. Abortion was still illegal at that time in the UK. Rees had gone through such procedures twice previously, but questions remained about the theory. Mainly, if it was an abortion gone wrong, then why strangle her? The abortion angle just doesn't seem to add up. 
With little real evidence, a lack of communication and trust between the police and the prostitutes, and a feeling amongst the public that prostitutes' lives weren't overly important, Gwyneth Rhee's death went unsolved and was quickly forgotten about. Again, as was the case with Elizabeth Figg, it is disputed as to whether or not Rees was a victim of Jack the Stripper. There are a few differences compared to the other murders, such as the dump site, but there are far more similarities between Rees' murder and those confirmed as part of the Hammersmith nude series of murders. Then we come to Hannah Telford. 30-year-old Hannah Telford of Head On On The Wall, Northumberland, England, was discovered in the Upper Moor Hammersmith area of London in February of 1964. Her body was recovered west of the Hammersmith Bridge on the Thames foreshore below Linden House, a clubhouse belonging to the London Corthinian Sailing Club. She was naked with the exception of some rolled up stockings. Her underwear, reportedly covered in semen, had been shoved in her mouth. Some accounts suggest Telford was also missing her front teeth. However, this is questionable as it doesn't appear to be mentioned in the coroner's report. The postmortem concluded that the cause of death was drowning and she also had bruising on both sides of her jaw. The coroner also concluded that she had been in the water anywhere from two to seven days. Hannah was reported missing ten days before her body was discovered. It is widely recognised that Hannah Telford was the first official victim of Jack the Stripper. Interesting to note, though, is that the coroner considered a judgement of suicide. I mean, this sounds very unlikely, given the underwear in her mouth, but it is interesting it was considered. Hannah, like several other victims, wasn't originally from London, but had found her way there as a teenage runaway. Like others, she too quickly found herself working as a prostitute as a way to get by. There are many stories that have been told about Hannah, and it's hard to work out which are true and which aren't. Hannah was believed to be involved in the making of sex tapes and working at sex parties. One story is that whilst working at a sex party for the rich and powerful, she was supposedly taken to a house and paid to have sex with a man in a gorilla suit whilst bystanders watched on and applauded. Another story was that Telford put an ad in her local paper trying to sell her unborn baby to the highest bidder. Despite the stories, there can be little question that Hannah at least worked sex parties. Due to Hannah Telford's history of working at these said parties for the members of high society, it has been theorised that her murder and others in the series may well be connected to high society and their sex parties. Police interviewed hundreds of people in regards to the murder, particularly those that were known to have used prostitutes. One was even reported to be an international footballer. Despite the high number of people interviewed about the murder, no one was arrested for the murder of Hannah Telford. Then we come to Irene Lockwood, 25-year-old Irene Charlotte Lockwood of Walkeringham, Nottinghamshire, England, sorry if I get that name wrong, was discovered in Duke's Meadow, Chiswick on April 8th of 1964. Her body was discovered on the foreshore of the Thames at Corny Reach, not far from where Hannah Telford had been found. Irene had been pregnant at the time of her death. Unfortunately, it is hard to decipher what is fact and what is fiction when it comes to the death of Irene Lockwood as no coroner's report seems to exist. It does appear that she had been strangled with a ligature of some kind, but that her actual cause of death was drowning. She was also found naked. It is also believed that she was four months pregnant at the time of her murder. Irene, again, like the others, wasn't a Londoner, but had found her way there and into the dark world of prostitution. Much like Telford, it is also strongly believed that Irene Lockwood was involved in other areas of the sex industry, such as making videos and attending parties. Irene Lockwood was also understood to blackmail her clients with the use of photographs and also to steal from them. For example, just a year before her death, a good friend of Irene's named Vicky Pender was battered to death for the same scheme. Less than three weeks after Irene Lockwood's death on the 27th of April, Kenneth Archibald walked into Notting Hill Police Station and confessed to the murder of Irene Lockwood. 57-year-old Archibald worked as a caretaker at the Holland Park Tennis Club. He had already been questioned about Irene, who he claimed he didn't know after they found a business card at her flat with his name on. This time, Archibald told the police he did know Lockwood, and on the night of her murder, he had a drunken argument with her, which ended with him putting his hands around her throat and throwing her in the river. Despite the confession, the police weren't totally convinced, and neither am I. They were positive that Irene Lockwood's murder was connected to at least one of the previous murders, and Kenneth Archibald had alibis for those crimes. More importantly, another victim was discovered just days before his confession. However, Archibald was sent to court for the murder in June of that year. Upon his trial, Archibald took back his confession to the murder of Irene Lockwood. He claimed he'd made the claim due to being drunk and depressed. With his confession being the only piece of evidence against Archibald, he was found not guilty and acquitted on the 23rd of June. It was at this point that the police came to realise they were dealing with a serial killer. 
Then we have Helen Bartholomew. On April 24th of 1964, just over two weeks after the murder of Irene Lockwood, police discovered the body of 22-year-old Helen Bartholomew. She had been strangled with a ligature and was naked. Her nose and cheekbone were also swollen to suggest she had been hit. Helen was also missing three front teeth. Unlike Hannah Telford and Irene Lockwood, Helen Barth- Bartholomew was found in an alleyway. Despite not being found in the water like Telford or Lockwood, police soon made the link to those murders due to the similarities. Police had also seen a pattern emerging. All the victims were prostitutes, obviously, but they were also short in stature and all had or recently had had an STD, which stands for sexually transmitted disease like gonorrhea or syphilis, stuff like that. Helen, who described herself as a striptease artist, had come to London from Blackpool. This came after her release from prison for a crime committed in Blackpool. Helen was accused of luring a man to the beach where he was set upon and attacked by three men. Bartholomew was originally convicted of aggravated burglary and given a four-year jail sentence. However, she was released on appeal after three months. Already a known prostitute in Blackpool, it was hardly surprising she took up the profession once in London. Known to frequent jazz clubs, it was also the police's belief that she was addicted to Indian hemp. Police got their first break in the case with the murder of Helen Bartholomew. They discovered specks of paint, the type used to spray paint cars and other metals on the woman's body. They also believed that as the body was filthy and covered in coal dust, that it must have been stored somewhere before being dumped in the alleyway. Police therefore came to the conclusion that if they could find a storage space where the paint was used, they could find their killer. It is strongly suspected that Jack the Ripper left the body of Helen Bartholomew in the alleyway due to increased police presence near the riverbanks. Police decided more was needed and decided to start logging any car registration numbers seen in the areas during hours of darkness. They also started to put female officers out on the streets disguised as prostitutes in the hope of luring the killer. Sadly, this failed to help prevent Jack from striking again. Then we come to the victim Mary Fleming. On July 14th, seated upright against a garage entrance, the naked body of 30-year-old Mary Fleming was found. Unlike other victims who appeared to have been disposed of with a minimum of fuss, Mary's body showed signs that she'd put up quite a fight. The same specks of paint found on the body of Helen Bartholomew were also present on the body of Mary Fleming. Mary had worked as a prostitute for over a decade and was known as a tough cookie. She would openly tell the story of the time she fought off an attacker who tried to strangle her. She was also wise enough to know the dangers of life working on the streets and was known to carry a knife with her. Regretfully, that wasn't enough to stop her falling victim to Jack the Stripper. On the morning of the murder, just before 5am and moments before Mary's body was discovered, neighbours heard a vehicle reversing down the street. Sadly, as fate would have it, no one actually saw the vehicle and thus the killer made his escape without repercussion. The police were now starting to feel that the killer would soon make a fatal mistake. They believed taking such high risks and his level of confidence would be the undoing of the man whom the press had now started calling Jack the Stripper. However, they were very sadly mistaken. Then we come to the victim, Francis Brown. On November 24th of 1964, the naked body of 21-year-old Francis Brown was discovered up a side street in Kensington. She had died from asphyxiation due to strangulation. Paint spots again were found on the body. One of her teeth had also been ripped from its socket. A gold ring and and a chain with a silver cross were missing from the victim's body. Frances Brown possibly shed a link to the earlier victim Hannah Telford as it was believed they both had a minor connection to the major political scandal known as the Profumo Affair, which is another case I will do in another episode of this podcast series. Brown had given evidence against Stephen Ward, who many believe was a scapegoat, and said that she was hired by him to sleep with men from the upper classes. Thanks to this connection and the belief that some of the other victims were involved in taking part in underground sex parties for the rich and powerful, several authors of the time and people were interested in the case have suggested people involved in the Profumo affair were also responsible for the Hammersmith nude murders. Frances Brown had been missing a month before her body was discovered. She was last seen getting into the car of a client by her friend and fellow prostitute Kim Taylor when the pair went off with two men separately. This again gave the police reinvigorated hope of catching Jack the Stripper as Taylor was able to give them a description of the men resulting in an identikit picture being released and a description of the car thought at the time to be a grey Ford Zephyr. Unfortunately, despite the identikit picture and interviewing over a thousand individuals, Jack the Stripper was still uncaptured and free to strike again. 
his final victim, that being Bridget O'Hara, on February 16th of 1965, behind a garage shed on the Huron Trading Industrial Estate in Acton, the body of Bridget O'Hara was found. The 28-year-old's body was naked, and again the specks of paint which were present on the bodies of the previous three victims were again found on Bridget O'Hara. The cause of death was asphyxiation. It was also believed that Bridget's front teeth were missing, O'Hara's body was partially mummified, and police believed this to have been from being stored in a cool, dry place for a prolonged period of time. Bridget was last seen on January 11th, over a month before she was discovered. Now we get into the police investigation. At this point, Detective Chief Superintendent John DeRose was called in to take charge of the Hammersmith nude murders investigation. Almost in an instant, DeRose increased the number of officers working on the case to almost double what they were before his arrival. Chief Superintendent John DeRose of Scotland Yard interviewed almost 7,000 suspects. In the spring of 1965, the investigation into the murders encountered a major breakthrough when a sample of paint which perfectly matched that recovered from several victims' bodies was found underneath a concealed transformer at the rear of a building on the Huron factory estate in Acton. This factory estate faced a paint spraying shop. Shortly thereafter, DeRose held a news conference in which he falsely announced that the police had narrowed the suspect pool down to 20 men and that by a process of elimination, these suspects were being eliminated from the investigation. After a short time, he announced that the suspect suspect pool contained only 10 members and then 3. There were no further known stripper killings following the initial news conference. According to writer Anthony Summers, Hannah Telford and Frances Brown, the stripper's third and seventh victims, were preferably connected to the 1963 Profumo affair. Some victims were also known to engage in the underground party scene in addition to appearing in pornographic movies of the time. Several writers have postulated that the victims may have known each other and that the killer may have been connected to this scene as well. Now we get into the many suspects in the case. So first off, we have the most well-known of suspects, and who everyone thought may have been the Jack the Stripper, which was Mungo Ireland. For DeRose, the most likely suspect was a Scottish security guard called Mungo Ireland, whom DeRose first identified in a BBC television interview in 1970 as a respectable married man in his 40s whom he codenamed Big John. Ireland had apparently been identified as a suspect shortly after Bridget O'Hara's murder when flecks of industrial paint were traced to the Heron Trading Estate, where he had worked as a security guard. Guard. Now, as I understand it, Ireland had worked briefly as a police officer before quitting after being passed up for a detective post. He also drove a van very similar to the one seen in the area where Mary Fleming was dumped. Finally, he worked the hours of 10pm to 6am, which fitted the times police believed the victims were dumped. In March of 1965, Mungo Ireland killed himself. He committed suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning in his car. Ireland left a note for his wife, which read, and I quote, I can't stick it any longer. It may be my fault, but not all of it. I'm so sorry Harry is a burden to you. Give my love to the kid. Farewell, jock. P.S. To save you and the police looking for me, I'll be in the garage. End quote. On that evidence, Mungo Island certainly seems a good candidate to have been Jack the Stripper. However, when picked at, there are also plenty of reasons to doubt his guilt. The biggest of all was uncovered by a journalist writing for The Sun in 1972. Owen Summers discovered that the man DeRose had claimed was the killer was in Scotland at the time of Bridget O'Hara's murder. Of course, that only rules Mungo Island out of being a killer, but it is pretty much a certainty that she was killed at the same hands of several of the other victims. Another doubt is cast on Ireland as a suspect by author David Seabrook. After investigating, he discovered Ireland had only actually worked at the Huron Trading Estate for three weeks, and other than the fact he worked there, it seemed he had no other links at all to the case. Seabrook also claimed to have found evidence to show that John DeRose was corrupt. Seabrook's belief was that to gain a final bit of glory, DeRose pinned the murders on a dead man. Finally, there also seems to be an explanation as to why he would write to save the police looking for me in his suicide note. Ireland was due in court the morning of his suicide due to a motoring offence. His wife also admitted that the pair were going through a difficult time in their marriage, which could well have been the reason for his suicide. It is therefore easy to discount some of what DeRose claimed, but one thing does make me wonder. If Mungo Ireland was innocent, why did his wife and other family members stand by whilst his name was, was dragged through the mud? And why would DeRose go on TV and so confidently declare there would be no more murders and risk his reputation if he wasn't certain.
Crime author Neil Milkins, sorry if I get that name wrong, said the killing stopped after Ireland's death and the police task force set up to catch the killer was reduced and finally disbanded. Milkins, who wrote the book Who is Jack the Stripper, was an investigative consultant for the BBC documentary Dark Sun, The Hunt for a Serial Killer. On the morning that Ireland's body was found, he had been due to appear before Acton Magistrates Court to face a charge of failing to stop his car after being involved in a road traffic accident, said Mr Milkins. Did Ireland commit suicide to save face? acting magistrates over a trifling motoring charge, or did John DeRose push him over the edge with his press statements?" End quote. The Scotland Yard Serious Crime Review Group reinvestigated the Hammersmith murders between 2006 and 2007, which resulted in a new conclusion. A statement read, and I quote, The circumstantial evidence against Mungo Island is very strong, and it was the view of the officers conducting the most recent review of this case that he was most likely to be responsible. End quote. Although Ireland's work records indicated he was in Scotland on the night of O'Hara's disappearance, Scotland Yard believe it is possible that these may have been falsified. Then we come to suspect Freddie Mills. In 2001, reformed gangster Jimmy Tippett Jr. claimed that during research for his book about London's gangland, he had uncovered information suggesting that British light heavyweight boxing champion Freddie Mills was responsible for the murders. According to Tippett, Cray era gangsters including Charlie Richardson and Frankie Fraser had long suspected Mills of being the murderer. Freddie Mills was an extremely popular English boxer during the 1940s. At one point, he was even considered Britain's biggest boxing star. And in 1948, he became the light heavyweight champion of the world. He retired in 1950 at the age of 30 and took up performing as an actor. On July 24th of 1965, Mills was discovered in his car. He'd suffered a gunshot wound to the head and died from his injuries in hospital. The coroner concluded that the angle of the bullet was consistent with that of a self-inflicted gun wound, so it was ruled that Freddie Mills had committed suicide. Mills's death is one that has many theories in and of itself. One reason given for his suicide is that he was struggling to cope with debts he owed to a crime syndicate, which involved the Cray twins, and so he decided to take his own life. Related to this theory is one which suggests Mills was actually murdered because of his debts. Also theorised with another murder, this time at the hands of gangsters, that wanted Mills's nightclub. Mills was adamant he wouldn't sell despite him being broke when he died, and so was murdered instead. Another rumour was that he was having a homosexual relationship. His rumoured gay lover, Michael Holliday, committed suicide, and it was claimed he took it badly and couldn't deal with the loss. Author and reformed gangster Jimmy Tippett claims that the real cause was Miller's fears he was to be arrested for the murders and revealed as Jack the Stripper. Tippett claims to have been readily told this by several sources while researching a book he was writing. A variant on that story passed down from a son of a gangland boss is one in which Mills and his lover Michael Holliday, who were both bisexual, had picked up a girl for a sadomasochistic party. Things went too far and the girl ended up dead and Mills disposed of the body. This must have been Elizabeth Figg, as the story then suggests things called off between the pair until a few years later. When the pair rekindled the relationship, the same thing happened again, and this leads to Holiday killing himself out of guilt. The officer in charge of investigating Freddie Mills' death has no doubts at all that he wasn't Jack the Stripper. Quote, These rumours were outrageous, for there is no justification for any suggestion that Freddie was, in any way, a suspect. End quote. This is what Nipper Reed, the investigator, had to say about the theory that Mills was Jack the Stripper. He also claimed Mills' name may have been confused with another suspect who allegedly committed suicide in 1965, who was a married man and a former boxer in his 40s. Sadly, this suspect was never named. One final factor that may discount Mills is that at no point did his car number plates come up in the investigation. You see, police started to check every number plate seen going in and out of the West End area of London where the victims went missing. With someone of Freddie Mills' high profile, it is highly unlikely that he would have been missed, and I tend to agree with that. Then we have the Metropolitan Police Officer Theory. David Seabrook, the author who did so much to discredit John DeRose's favourite suspect, Mungo Ireland, claimed to have his own suspect. Sadly, he didn't name the suspect, presumably for fear of the libel laws. Writer Stuart Holm actually, however, figured out the suspect from details Seabrook had given in his book fairly easily. The main source for the suspect seems to be Detective Superintendent William Baldock. He attempted to build a case on the former police officer, but was unable to do so. The officer who Baldock and Seabrook accused was convicted of various petty crimes and was jailed. It was later revealed by the officer that he committed these crimes merely to make various police departments and fellow officers look foolish for the way they had treated him. Seabrook therefore made the case that if he was willing to commit robberies to make fellow officers look stupid, then hell, why not murder? He also pointed out that each of the last six 
victims were left in a different police subdivision and believed only an officer would know this. Seabrook also argues that this is enough of a reason for the killer to stop the murders as he had succeeded in his aim to make the police look stupid. Baldock, Seabrook's fellow accuser on the other hand, was of the opinion he would kill again after the death of the final victim Bridget O'Hara, which of course didn't happen. Questions remain about the officer as a suspect though, I mean, the officer in question seems to have been a somewhat incompetent burglar, one reason he was caught was he rode to the crimes on his own moped, so I question whether he would have been able to get away with the murders. It also seems a far leap from committing a few petty crimes to murder just to embarrass a few people who irked the said officer. Finally, there seems to be no connection to the actual murders themselves, which even Seabrook or Baldock failing to make a connection to the Hammersmith nude murders. Then we come to the suspect Tommy Butler. In their book The Survivor, which came out in 2002, Jimmy Evans and Martin Short allege the culprit Detective Chief Superintendent Butler was named as the man behind the murders. In truth, there seems no evidence or link to the murders, and it does seem that Evans merely holds a grudge against Butler. Butler died five years after the final murder in the series and was dead long before the allegations were made by Evans. Butler died in 1970. Then we have corrupt officers in the Profumo affair. The Profumo affair led to the trial conviction and ultimately the suicide of Stephen Ward. Many, however, believe that Ward was set up by corrupt officers paid by Labour MPs to help bring down the government at the time, run by the Conservatives. Two of these officers are believed to have threatened prostitutes into giving false evidence against Ward. One of the officers died in 1966 from a heart attack. At the time of his death, the first officer had £30,000 in his bank account, which seemed to be hard to account for. The theory is that it was money earned through helping with the cover-up. His partner went to Australia the same year, then seemingly vanished off the face of the earth. Interestingly, various stories have also circulated over the years that police at Hendon suspected a police officer who fled to Australia. Could that officer be the same one that was involved in the Profumo affair? One theory is that the two officers as part of the cover-up killed the prostitutes that didn't comply or that were felt could unravel the cover-up. On one hand, the pair makes for interesting suspects. However, that is only if you believe all the victims were involved in the trial of Stephen Ward. But this isn't the case at least as far as we know. Francis Brown was involved as a witness, and there are several that believe Hannah Telford may have been too, but there is no evidence any of the other victims were linked. Then we come to suspect Harold Jones. In 1921, at just 15 years of age, Harold Jones was convicted of the murder of two young girls in Abertilly, Wales. I do apologise if I get that name wrong. His first victim was eight-year-old Frida Bennell. Harold lured her into the shed where he sexually assaulted her and brutally attacked her. Then, later that night, dumped her body in a nearby lane. The following morning, her body was found and Jones was eventually charged with her murder. The jury struggled to believe a 15-year-old boy could be responsible for such a horrible crime and he was found not guilty. Upon his release, Harold Jones was given a hero's welcome by the town of Abertilly as they, too, couldn't believe that a 15-year-old boy from the village had been responsible. In their eyes, it had to be an outsider. Sadly, their belief in the innocence of a 15-year-old boy would come back to haunt them. Just weeks after his release, Harold Jones would murder 11-year-old Florence Little. Jones lured young Florence into his house before cutting her throat in the kitchen then dragging her into his attic. This time Harold did not get away with his crime. Due to his age, Harold Jones avoided the death penalty and was released after serving 20 years in 1941. In 1947, he surfaced in London and from all known accounts, he went on to marry and have a daughter and generally led a normal happy family life. However, author Neil Milkins believes Jones may be responsible for the Hammersmith nude murders. After research for a book on the Arbatilli murders, Jones admitted Milkins kept researching what Jones did after his release from prison. Milkins discovered that Harold Jones had lived just a few streets away from three of the victims at various times. Milkins also found that Jones had been working at a, as a street metal worker, meaning he would have used industrial paint, similar to the type found on several victims. This and other findings all seemed too much of a coincidence to Milkins, and so he claimed Harold Jones could well have been the murderer known as Jack the Stripper. Unfortunately, record keeping isn't what it is nowadays, and so police never knew they had a convicted murderer living so close to the crimes. Thus, Harold Jones was never a suspect in the Hammersmith nude murders. Harold Jones is an interesting suspect. On the one hand, Neil Milkins makes an extremely strong case for Jones as the killer, and surely if police had known a convicted murderer lived near where two of the crimes were committed, he would have been a suspect in the rise too. 
It has to be added, though, that there is no actual evidence Jones had any connection to any of the victims or the case at all. The method is also different, as Jones didn't kill either of his victims by asphyxiation. Also, why did he stop at Bridget O'Hara's murder, as Jones didn't die until 1971? Finally, was Jones too old to be Jack the Stripper anyway? He was 58 at the time of the final murder. To this day, the Jack the Stripper slash the Hammersmith nude murders remain unsolved. The suspect was never caught or identified. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions, it still remain unanswered. Please rate this show and let me know what you guys think about this and the many other cases I've covered. You can follow me on all major social media platforms, YouTube, BitChute, Dailymotion. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Links are all down below in the description. If you have a case you'd like me to have a look at or cover, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm your host, and this has been the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Until next time. Next on Unanswered Question. The Yuba County Five were a group of young men from Yuba City, California, with mild intellectual disabilities or psychiatric conditions who attended a college basketball game at California State University Chico on the night of February 24th of 1978. 